Good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of the joys of being part of this community is that frequently each summer, people from other congregations, other parts of town, or frankly even other parts of the country come visiting us. They may be here in the hall or they may be joining us online. And they're, learning, they're seeking to learn a little bit more about who we are, what makes us tick, and to see if this might be a home for them. You visitors are deeply welcome. It may take us a little bit to say that, but you visitors are deeply welcome, and we hope you'll return. With you in mind, it may be helpful to explain a little bit about this whole Lamas thing and what it is we're doing today. We're primarily a humanist congregation, and it's intrinsic to the human experience to consider and connect with the cycle of the seasons. As you heard earlier in the reading from Celestially Auspicious Occasions, in many forms, this observation has been a part of human communities throughout human history. Presumably, it will continue to be, so long as human communities continue to exist. The meanderings of our local star in the sky up and down from solstice to equinox to solstice again, have marked not only the seasons of our world, but the seasons of our lives. In his classic memoir of a year spent living in nature on Cape Cod a century ago, titled The Outermost House, writer Henry Beston spoke eloquently for many of us when he wrote, all these autumn weeks I have watched the great disk going south along the horizon of the moorlands beyond the marsh, now sinking behind this field, now behind this leafless tree, now behind this sedgy hillock dappled with the snow. We lose a great deal, he wrote, when we lose this sense and feeling for the sun. When all has been said, the adventure of the sun is the great natural drama by which we live, and not to have joy in it, and awe of it, not to share in it, is to close a dull door on nature's sustaining and poetic spirit. Here at FUS, we have a long tradition of marking the solstices and equinoxes, and for at least the past decade or so, we have also created for ourselves a tradition of marking one of what are called the cross-quarter days, the halfway points between the equinoxes and solstices. Three of these four days have passed into current culture under other names and other disguises. Halloween, Groundhog's Day, May Day. Lamas is the one that tends to be forgotten. It's the midpoint between the summer solstice and the fall equinox. In agricultural societies, Lamas marks the beginning of the turn from tending crops to harvesting them. In Western culture, the emphasis at Lamas tends to be on grains, and in particular, wheat. This point in the season cycle is often marked with rituals involving bread. Indeed, the name Lamas is understood to be derived from the term loaf mass, as in loaf of bread. This has certainly been our tradition, and we're grateful for the volunteers who are downstairs right now baking bread for us to enjoy later. More on that to come. Over the years, we've explored themes like the role of bread in bringing people together in community, including through the ritual of communion. We've reflected on the role of wheat and baking in the birth and growth of Minneapolis, the home of Pillsbury and General Mills. Last year, sadly, we reflected on the impact of Russia's war against Ukraine on the wheat harvests and on global hunger. Even more sadly, that particular story remains in the news a year later. Some folks have wondered how we find different ways to talk about wheat, bread, baking, and the like from year to year, but really, the ideas of bread and grains, like the experience of the cycle of the seasons, is in essence inextricably woven into the fabric of the human experience itself. A theme always emerges. But whatever the year's particular take on Lamas may be, we find within it reason to celebrate and to be thankful. Our ancestors used the occasion as one for celebration as well. Having labored for months to sow and tend their crops, this was the point where they were at last able to begin the transition from encouraging growth to reaping the products of that growth. And of course, we know that absolutely critical to that growth was copious sunshine, 
the light of the same sun, which has been such a central feature of humanity's existence since time immemorial. Though it certainly took people a while to figure out the exact mechanics of how it all works, for untold ages, plants from algae to aspen trees have been converting sunlight into leaves, stems, and branches, as well as the fruits, vegetables, grasses, and grains which sustain other life forms, including ourselves. Just think of it. Every time you enjoy, well, today we'll just use the example of wheat and flour, you're tasting the energy, taking in the energy of the sun in a different form. As David said in his opening words this morning, we are eating rain and sun. Now, if you happen to be a space geek like me and find the photos of other planets and moons like Mars and Titan fascinating, perhaps because the rocks and hills bathed in the light of our same sun seem familiar, one thing that's hard to escape noticing is how barren these places seem to be. No trees, no shrubs, no vines, no plants at all, even with all of that light. The scenes seem familiar, but are plainly not particularly hospitable and welcoming. Yet here, we are literally surrounded by countless plants as they quietly work their magic. As humanists, we really have no need for talking snakes and parting seas and the like. Look around you. We live our whole lives within a miracle. Growth is not only a function of sunlight, obviously. For most plants, including crops like wheat, growth is contingent on a trifecta of so-called inputs, sunlight, of course, but also water and nutrients within the soil. If the soil is poor or is depleted from over-farming in previous seasons, or if we experience floods, or their opposite, a drought, which seems increasingly to be our fate in recent years, the crops will suffer and potentially fail altogether. Anthropologists believe that failures of harvests throughout history have led not only to individual suffering, but to upheaval, and in some cases even to societal collapse. We are as dependent on and connected to the sun when it's converted to plant form as we are on the sun itself. Celebrating its cycle is one powerful and poignant way of reminding ourselves of this basic reality. In preparing for this talk, I did some research on the growth of wheat. Usually, I seem to find articles which broke down the process into six steps. That's great, but we don't have really that much time this morning. So I kept on searching, and eventually I found a resource that helpfully narrowed it just down to three stages, which I thought was a lot more manageable. Now, as an aside, I know I'm treading on risky territory. Uh, yes, it sounds like I'm gearing up to talk about things which may seem scientific, and it's not really my strong suit, considering that I was in humanities. But beyond that, I am aware, as you may also be, that as Unitarians, our forebears chose this label to distinguish themselves from Trinitarians. And so doing things in group of three can get a little dicey. I did it earlier, talking about the trifecta of sunlight, water, and soil, and now I'm about to do it again with three phases of growth. And, spoiler alert, I'll be doing it yet again later on. So, in fact, I'll be doing it three times three. <laughs> and all I ask is, please don't tell David Breeden. <laughs> Alternatively, tell David this is the sort of thing that happens when he has the audacity to go on sabbatical. The source of our three-phase description of wheat growth is a, is a website called yara.co.uk. And to be honest, it doesn't really go into great detail about any of the phases it identifies, so I've brought a little poetic license to the content, or maybe a lot of poetic license to the content. But at least it provided a place to start. The first of the phases that, uh, that this source identifies is one they call foundation. In essence, it seems to cover the phase of development from the first sprouting of the seed underground to the initial emergence of life arising from the soil. Remember I mentioned earlier that Groundhog's Day was one of those cross-quarter days? Though today we associate that day with a surprisingly clairvoyant rodent. In the past, and among many pagans today, the occasion was known as Imbolg, pronounced a number of different ways, and is marked as the time in the agricultural cycle when seeds underground, unseen, begin to waken from their winter hibernation, crack open their seed casings, 
and start to grow both up and down, sending roots down and a tiny shoot slowly up toward the surface of the soil. Let's take a step back and imagine that for a moment, won't you? Imagine what it would be like to be that seed. You've been sealed up in some kind of shell or husk or some other form of containment. And yet you're brimming with the potential of life, which may come into its own someday, though you're not quite there yet. And if that's not bad enough, you've been buried in dirt. That doesn't sound like a really promising situation. And yet, that's where it begins. This turns out to be exactly what you need to begin to break free, to root yourself, to grow at last, to begin the path to your destiny. If one were to anthropomorphize that little seed, I can imagine it feeling just an overwhelming sense of joy. Have you ever felt such a moment yourself? A time when you felt constrained, limited, fenced in, and then began to experience a magical moment when the shell cracks and you begin to stretch and move and grow? When you start to put down fresh roots to take a chance and begin anew? Do you find such moments here, perhaps a liberation from past beliefs or practices, the joy of new insights and perspectives? Word to visitors, I believe this is the sort of place FUS aspires to be. The middle of the three phases of wheat growth, my sources report, is called construction. I think a part of their suggested definition of this phase merits being quoted here. The construction phase starts from the first node being detectable through to flowering. This is a critical period as yield delivering leaves, deep roots, fertile florets, and stem reserves form. So our little wheat plant has begun developing its roots and has now burst forth into the sunlight. And so begins a process of dramatic growth. Here is when the wheat plants seem to shoot from the ground, ultimately rising several feet into the air. They're, of course, responding to the glorious, abundant energy fed them by the sun. It's as if the wheat plants are reaching out to touch it, to come into direct contact with that force. In these early months of the season, the growing stalks have not yet reached their final stage. They are, in a sense, en route to that point. Given the right inputs, they will get there, eventually. But this is a time when you might think of them in aspiring mode. To, again, assign them human emotions, the plants seem to be reaching for something just beyond their grasp, as if in a spirit of hope for success. Have you ever done that? Stretched yourself? Challenged yourself? Reached for some goal in a way that made you grow as a result? Perhaps you applied for a job you weren't sure you could get, or traveled to a new location you weren't entirely familiar with, or even tried a new recipe for a dish you'd never prepared? If you've ever done this, stretched, reached out for something new, surely there was a risk of failure. But to take these chances on growth requires a degree of hope that you can do it. What gives you hope? As we swelter in this smoky, record-breaking summer of 2023, as we watch our political system creak under the stress of relentless attacks, as we watch the steady erosion of rights and protections so critical to various marginalized populations, it's easy to lose hope. But still, something gets us out of bed in the morning and motivates us to keep trying to make a difference. Maybe it's nothing more than a not quite fully formed hope that somehow it will all work out. Or maybe it is a resilience that makes us grow tall and strong like wheat that we derive from being among friends and who share our hopes and our commitment to always reaching, always striving to make ourselves and our world the very best they can be. One of my hopes is that FUS will always be a place where hopeful people can come together to draw strength from one another, to encourage one another, a place where hope itself can flourish. 
According to my British friends, the third and final stage of wheat growth is production. They say that the production phase starts just past flowering, lasting through to the grains filling and ripening. In other words, this is it, the finale. Having burst its shell, put down roots, and reached out to meet the sun, our wheat stalk at last fulfills its agricultural destiny, producing the grain its sowers and tenders have anticipated through the entire growing season. Soon, the reapers will come through, cutting the stalks down to be threshed. In other words, to loosen the grain from the stalk itself. To continue with our unexpectedly and probably unsupportably anthropomorphic reflection on wheat, imagine for a moment you were that wheat. After being planted and tended, nurtured into life, this is the moment and the way for you to offer something back, to offer thanks, to show gratitude. And it wasn't just some sort of mere symbolic expression of gratitude either. It really was a gift of itself, something very meaningful, the sort of offering which will likely nourish others, being ground into flour and baked into bread perhaps, or maybe just stored until the sowing time returns. But either way, it is the means for this lowly wheat stalk to bequeath a tasty, grainy legacy for the future. How do you experience gratitude? There are likely to be various people in all our lives who consciously or not nurture us, look out for us, provide care. Do we give thanks? And how? It can be humbling and yet affirming to know we are part of an interconnected web, not only of all existence, but also of deep caring. And it's quite likely mutual. You too are likely a nurturer for others. I hope FUS is the sort of place where you feel supported, where you might nurture, and a place where you might feel inspired to bring something meaningful of yourself, to give in gratitude, to sustain this community into the future. We're here at all today because for over 140 years, people like us have been expressing their gratitude so that we, their heirs, may reap the benefits. And now it's our turn. Whether or not you feel it is an obligation to continue this tradition of gratitude, may FUS ever be the sort of place that makes you feel it is a privilege to do so. Now, with all this in mind, we thought today we would put a new twist on an old practice that we haven't seen much of these past few pandemic years. I'm gonna invite our ushers, yes, ushers, right? Uh, to they are in the front of the room. Um, as you will see, they have the baskets, which we may all remember, but unlike in past times, when the baskets were passed, you were invited to put something in. Today, as the baskets go around, you're invited to take something out. You will see that each basket is full of folded pieces of paper. On each piece of paper, you will find one of three questions, which are hopefully randomly mixed together. As you remove a piece of paper, please leave it folded for now. Don't open it until everyone has one. If you see someone near you who may need some help reading what's on the slip, please offer that assistance as you're able. For those of you who are joining us online today, in a moment the three questions that are being circulated through the hall here will be placed into the chat. Please read each and simply pick the one which seems to speak the most to you today. And when you're ready, put your own answer back into the chat. I'm just going to stall briefly while the bass. We are rusty at this, aren't we? Right? I mean, send that thing through. But thank you all for playing along. There are a couple of scofflaws who ended up in the balcony today, and so they've, they've been warned that it's all happening down here on the main floor. Just what's going on over here? Oh, okay. As the slips move slowly through the room, I would go ahead and invite you, if you have one, to open that slip up and read the question that's on the piece of paper. Just read it to yourself. Very good. 
good. Yeah, Jane, if maybe you could come on over and help this side of the room over here. Just give it a second. We could have some cocktail music. <laughs> I could sing, but some of you remember the last time I sang here, so we won't be doing that again. It looks like just about everybody has a piece of paper at this point, so go ahead, as I said, uh, read the question to yourself, and then when you're ready, I invite you to turn to somebody near you and to share the answer that you have to that question. Uh, uh, preferably somebody who didn't come with you today. And not only just share the answer, but share a little bit about why you picked that particular answer. For those of you online who are doing this in the chat, I, I would encourage you to do the same thing. Not just say, here's the answer, but here's why I chose that answer. So we'll just take a brief time. If you are sitting kind of by yourself, feel free to kind of scooch over and find someone to, to chat with. We'll do this for just a short bit. It's, it's fine. You don't have to move Okay, everybody. I, I really do hate to interrupt this conversation because this is wonderful to hear. It really is. Um, but we need, to, we need to wrap up so we can all go downstairs and enjoy the delicious bread that they're making for us. As I looked out across the room, while you were all speaking together, I have to admit, I, I couldn't make out a single word uh, that anybody was saying. Uh, but of course, that wasn't the point. When we gather here on Sunday mornings, it's not only to hear someone up here speak, most assuredly not on Sundays when I speak, but it's also about the community we find when we're here. We give to and receive from one another, and in the words of the third principle, we encourage one another to spiritual growth. Any one of you has as important a message to share as anything that gets said up here. As I said, I couldn't really make out a lot of what was said, but from up here, what I heard was just a cacophony of joy, hope, and gratitude. And it was fantastic. I'm gonna suggest you hang on to those slips. 
Downstairs, after the assembly, our membership director, Suzanne, will be hosting a station at the welcome table where you'll be invited to write just a few words on that slip, reflecting how you answered that question. You do not need to share any personal information if you don't wish. And to tape these to a display where we'll have a chance to see just some of the joy, hope, and gratitude that is present among us today. This is, in a sense, our Lama's harvest. Now, with that in mind, I'm going to invite you to stand when called on to do so. <laughs> and as you're willing and able, some of you may end up standing for a few minutes. So if you do need to sit, just sit, raise your hand as, as, as appropriate. So, who out there heard, heard from someone else a story of joy? Please stand. Excellent. For those of you who are standing, please remain standing, okay, as you're able. Who out there heard a note of hopefulness? Please stand. Wonderful. Again, if you're standing and are able, please remain standing. And finally, who was told of an experience of gratitude? Please stand. Thank you. Re please remain standing again as you're able. Um, in his poem, As I Walked Out One Evening, W.H. Auden began with these words. As I walked out one evening, walking down Bristol Street, the crowds upon the pavement were fields of harvest wheat. Likewise, the crowd before me, you, are a field of harvest wheat. While actual wheat grows when provided with three key resources, sunlight, water, soil nutrients, this morning you have stood tall like stalks of wheat because you were provided with something that we find powerful, nurturing, and vital. Our nutrients, joy, hope, gratitude. Just as these may metaphorically relate to the growth of wheat in the field, they more directly relate to our own growth as people, as spiritual people as a congregation. We all know life is not always rainbows and unicorns, and that this is a place where we will also bring our challenges and our griefs. But Lamas is a time when we can remember, too, that this is a place to bring and find the best. May FUS always be a place where you, like wheat, can put down roots, grow, and blossom. 